All right, so the sermon tonight, I'm hoping, will be an encouragement to you. Uh, this is uh, meant to edify and strengthen you know, our church and people individually uh, who might be dealing with different either pain or trials or grief or just, just problems that are, that are going on in your life. And, and hopefully you get some comfort from God's word. Our, our lives as Christians are very unique. You know, the Bible says that he's called us to be peculiar people. And it is. It's very odd. It's very different to, to have the mindset of a Christian according to God's word. As I was preaching this morning on, you know, uh, soul winning and how in Acts chapter 5, the disciples we're facing all this persecution. They're getting beat up. They're getting thrown in prison and they're rejoicing, right? That is something that is completely at odds with the way that any normal person, when I say normal, worldly, just growing up in the world, would think. It's, it's not the way that people generally think. Oh, uh, that things are good that are happening to me when I'm, when I'm <laughs> having pain and problems and things like that. But this is a mindset that God wants us to have. And because we know, the Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It doesn't say depending on what time and age you live in or where you live or anything like that. It says that it's going to happen. So if you will live godly, if that's what you desire to do, if that's what you start to do, if that's what you try to do, you are going to suffer uh, persecution. One way or another, some form of tribulation is going to come your way. Because at the very least, if you're starting to do work for the Lord, the enemy, the devil, the, you know, you're going to meet opposition from people who hate God, from people who don't want the gospel being promoted. You will get opposition. It's going to happen. And that could come from all variety of different people. It could be from family, friends, whatever. And, and you will start to face persecution. You're going to start to face hard times. But the Bible frequently tells us that, you know, not to worry about things. We don't want this to be a distraction. And in fact, there's many instances where persecutions can be a good thing and something we should rejoice over because that's just showing, that's evident that we are doing a good job in following in Christ's steps when we receive similar persecutions to what he received. When, when he goes through a lot, we see him doing right and then suffering wrongfully, and we follow that same pattern, we can rejoice in that. Now, obviously, the Bible tells us, look, if you do things worthy of punishment and worthy of stripes and worthy of, of you know, bad things happening because of your own sin or because of you know, things that you do to bring on yourself, hey, yeah, you need to take it patiently when you get chastised, when you, when you receive punishment, but there's no real benefit to that. I mean, you're just, you're just reaping what you've sown. But when you're receiving things based off of, you know, it's, it's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. You're just trying to live a, a godly life. You're just trying to do what's right. And then people come and do bad things to you. God wants us to have the mindset of, one, not being discouraged, but being encouraged. We're going to look at some examples this evening and try to draw some strength from this because I don't want any of you, God doesn't want any of you getting worn out, getting weary and well-doing, feeling knocked down and from, from any trials or persecutions or even unanswered prayers. We'll get into that a little bit too. Or, or perceived unanswered prayers from God and, and kind of get in a, in, a, in a bad state of mind and, uh, and really hamper what you end up doing for God or maybe cause to shake your faith or anything like that. Let's look at the Apostle. The Apostle Paul is a great example of someone who had to deal with a lot of this stuff. I mean, we, see, we get to see a lot into the life of the Apostle Paul, but we're going to focus in here on verse number 7 in 2 Corinthians 12, where we just read. The Bible says, "...and lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations..." There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So Paul's telling us, he's letting us know that as we, as we very well know, we read the scripture, you look at the New Testament, how many epistles were given by the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul has an abundance of revelations that God is using him 
mightily to just transmit the word of God. So this is an area, because he's being used so much, it's an area where he can start, you know, there's a, there's a possibility that he can become exalted above measure, that whether it be himself personally getting prideful or other people just trying to elevate, wow, the Apostle Paul in elevating his status above being the man that he is, right? I mean, no one, no man should have that, his status or his position just elevated above measure. And that's what he's saying, above measure, lest, lest I should be exalted above measure because of the abundance of revelations, because of how he's being used, because of all this stuff, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. So a thorn in the flesh, this is a physical problem that he, that he received. This is, this is a physical ailment that, that afflicted the Apostle Paul. And the purpose was to keep him humble and to keep him low in his service to God. It says, that's why I said, lest I should be exalted above measure. So he said the, the messenger of Satan was sent to buffet him. So it's one of, one of Satan's minions basically had, had caused injury to the Apostle Paul. That's the thorn in the flesh that he received. So I don't know. I mean, the Bible is not ex really explicit, but it says this messenger of Satan to buffet me. It's very possible that either like, he got, he, someone threw a rock at him or hit him physically, like with their hand and caused this injury. And when we, when we look through, I think the injury had to do with his vision, with his sight, because, um, well, we'll get into it. There's, there's a few reasons why I believe that he had this infirmity in his flesh, but, um, it doesn't really matter. Again, it doesn't, it doesn't matter the specifics of exactly what was wrong with him for the purpose of the sermon anyways. Um, so he, he receives this, either this wound, whatever it is, this thorn in the flesh. And it says in verse eight, for this thing, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. So he's praying to God that, that this problem would go away. God, help me with this, you know, I, what, this uh, buffeting that I received, this, this ailment, this thorn in my flesh. God, make this go away. Whether it be his sight that's here, God, make my sight come back. God, help me to, to, to overcome this. He's praying for his health to return. And three times he's going to God in prayer. Now, look, first of all, there's nothing wrong with that. This is a good thing to, to, to bring your cares to Jesus, to bring them to God, to ask God to help you in all of your trials and tribulations and persecutions. We see through the book of Psalms that David's doing that over and over again, just going to the Lord and asking him for help. We should be doing the same thing and relying on him. But we also need to realize, ultimately, God knows what's best for us. And we need to be able to have the faith to take the comfort in that. So if God decides not to do what we're asking him to do, and you're living a godly life, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, it's still going to be for your benefit. And what he says here, because God answers Paul when he's, he's seeking him, God, you know, Please remove this from me. Three times. Verse 9, it says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So his response to his prayer from God was, My grace is sufficient for thee. And that's the title of my sermon this morning. And this is the big takeaway I want you to, to leave when we, when we leave this evening, just to remember Throughout your life, God's grace is sufficient for you. No matter what you go through in this life, the grace of God. Think of the grace of God. I was just explaining grace out sowing today to someone who didn't know what grace meant. Grace is something you receive that you don't deserve. You don't deserve at all but something is still given to you anyways out of love. God's grace saves us. We don't deserve eternal life. 
We don't deserve a pardon for our sins. We don't deserve that forgiveness. But God extends grace unto us and gives us forgiveness of sins and gives us eternal life as a free gift. And he says, that grace is sufficient for thee. And we need to have that mindset and that attitude as we have our problems, as we go through this life, that we don't ever neglect the reality of our situation and become so spoiled or arrogant in ourselves of thinking that we somehow deserve heaven or just forget that we've been saved from our sins, that God has already given us this great grace and start having a bad attitude towards God because, well, hey, I keep praying to God, how come you're not taking away this problem in my life and how come you're not taking away that problem in my life? This is an attitude adjustment for us to realize God's grace is sufficient for us. It's enough. If God chooses to never do one thing for you, but save your soul, Amen. His grace is sufficient. Right. And this is something that we need to remember. Because it is something that may be easy to forget. Especially when you're going through the hard time. When things are going great, yeah, it's pretty easy to remember that. Oh yeah, sure. Praise God. But when you're just really dealing with something tough and it's really drawing at your heart or really, you know, just, just a big problem in your life, that becomes a big focus. And understandably so, but let's not forget the words of the Lord. My grace is sufficient for thee. And then he goes on to explain this even further. It's not that God is being cruel and doesn't want to answer, you know, his adopted son's request. Because we see in many places that God is merciful and, and, and he's full of grace and he, he will hear our prayers and, you know, ask and you shall receive. And there's many areas where we see God will do what we ask him to do. He will answer our prayers in the way that we ask them. That, that we, we get promises like that. But if he chooses not to, there's a reason for it. And in this case, there's a good reason for this. One, it was keeping him humble. But Paul already was like saying, okay, you know, I got the message and I think everyone else has the message and can we just make this go away now, right? Like I'm, I'm going to stay humble and, and we're not, I'm not getting lifted up here. So can we just get me back to, to where, where I was before? But this is, this is what he says. He says, my grace is sufficient for is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness so the weakness the affliction the problem that the Apostle Paul had was actually able to then even bring even more glory unto God and God's strength was able to be known more because Paul was weak and God is able to use the weak and the beggarly and the low people of this world to do the greatest things for God. God likes to demonstrate his power because he gets all the credit and all the glory for that. When you have someone who already seems like, you know, just naturally they're a good speaker, they've got all these other good, you know, these great attributes, or they're a good warrior or whatever, right? Uh, like, that's why we have a story of David and Goliath. When you have a Goliath and he's beaten, you know, killing a bunch of people, you know, if God were using Goliath to kill a bunch of people, there's not as much glory going to go to God because people are going to say, well, of course, I mean, the guy's huge. Who can beat him? But when God takes a David, this ruddy, you know, fair countenance, young guy who's not a warrior, not a soldier, not some, you know, man trained in, you know, from his youth to be a, to be a warrior, to kill this huge giant, well, now people can see God in that. One example of many throughout Scripture where God uses people specifically with their weaknesses, with those problems, to do even more work to show God is in this. And he's saying to Apostle Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. God's strength is made perfect in weakness. Mo and, then, and then the Apostle Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So now he's saying, well, now I have a different attitude about it. 
Now I'm going to glory in the fact that I have these problems. Hey, praise God that I've got this problem. Why? Because I want the power of Christ to rest in me that much more. If, if, if me having these physical problems and weaknesses is going to somehow bring more glory and honor unto God, then, then all right, let's do this. Let's have this testimony. And, and if you think about it, what a powerful testimony it is for people to give of God when things aren't going your way. It's, it's the same, because the, the mindset out there in the unbelieving world is that is similar to that of Satan's mindset when he was accusing Job. So if you remember, God had blessed Job. Job was an upright man. Job was, was like the best guy living at that time, and God had blessed him and built a hedge about him, and he had all this financial goods and children, and everything was going great for Job. Well, the devil's mindset was, well, yeah, of course he's going to serve you because he's got everything going good for him. And this is a similar mindset that's out in the world because the devil's deceived the lost. And this is what he's planted in their heads, thinking, oh, yeah, of course, you're gonna, of course they're serving God now. But when people can retain their integrity, even when you lose things, even when you go through loss and still serve God, that shows how much more you know, sincerity there is, that shows and demonstrates, no, God really, you know, this person really does believe this. It's not just uh, a belief of convenience. This isn't just a crutch. You believe on God in good times and in bad times. That will demonstrate and give more glory and honor unto the Lord. So when Job was able to say, hey, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord, that's powerful. And that brings a lot more glory than unto the Lord when people can see that in, in, in all seasons, whether he's abounding or abased, the faith is still there. And Apostle Paul says here in verse number 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. When you get weak, when you're, and look, this has to do with, and I'm, I'm not going to bring this up again, but this just has to do with when you know you're doing what's right. I'm not talking about you just reaping what you've sown because you've just been in sin and now you're, you're, you're getting punished or chastened from doing wrong. That's not what this is talking about. This is all about you're doing right. I mean, not, no one's perfect, but you're, you know, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing yet you're still having these problems and reproaches and you're suffering the trials and persecutions. For Christ's sake, he says, well, then when I'm weak physically, I'm strong spiritually because Christ's power is going to rest on him that much more. Because God's going to use him more because he's weak to give God more glory and honor. And, and this is a mindset that we ought to try to retain as we go through problems and suffer persecutions or distresses or and, and all the things he lists here. These aren't just persecutions. He says, I take pleasure in infirmities. So just you know, when you're sick or when you have physical problems, that doesn't have to be a persecution. That's just an infirmity. In reproaches, okay, yeah, there's someone, you know, reproaching you, telling you you're wrong or, or saying bad things about you. But then what about in necessities? That doesn't necessarily have anything to do with persecution either. It's just you're in need. You, you have some needs that you're going through. You don't have a lot of money. You're going through a hard time. You're kind of struggling through a hard time. In persecutions and then in distresses for Christ's sake. So all of these various Things that you could be going through as you're living for God, he's saying, you know, I'm going to take pleasure in those things because I know that the harder things become for me physically in this world, whether it be persecutions or these other needs and things in heaven, God can just use me that much more. God's spirit and power can, can just come upon me that much more and that much stronger. He says, well, I'm going to rejoice in that. I'm going to take pleasure in that. And we need to remember and think about, you know, especially this, this earth is not our home. 
We need to keep our eyes focused on the heavenly things, the heavenly Jerusalem, what's going to come. We're here for a short period of time. We may go through an uncomfortable period for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in this lifetime. And it may be uncomfortable for, a, for many of those times. But if you exchange the temporal comfort here for eternal rewards, that's an easy, that should be an easy decision to make. Because the eternal value is so much more in your favor <laughs> than, than the temporal ones that are just going to be gone anyways here today, gone tomorrow. It, it's, uh, it really is unequal in balance what God ends up giving you as a result of you suffering for him. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter number 8. Romans 8, we're going to briefly cover when you have some perceived unanswered prayers, just a little bit more insight into this. Just like the Apostle Paul here, he's saying, you know, I, I besought the Lord thrice that, that this affliction, this problem, this infirmity would go away. And, uh, and basically God said, no, my grace is sufficient for thee. Sometimes we ask for things and you don't see them answered, at least not the way that, that you're asking, not the way that you want, right? But it doesn't mean that they don't end up getting answered. There's two things we have to remember. One is that God does things in God's time, not in your time. And sometimes there is a good value, whether you realize it or not, to what you go through. Pain, grief, can end up being valuable in the long run and end up ultimately strengthening you. But um, look at Romans 8, 26. We're going to see this also because sometimes we don't even ask the right prayers. We're not even asking the right thing. We think we are, but, but it's really not what we need. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. <laughs> we don't know. We don't really know what we should pray for as we ought to pray, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Thank God he gave us the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to help us when we are going through hard times, when we do have problems and we want to pray to God and we, we think we know what we need and the Spirit's going, no, 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 hold on a second. That's not really, <laughs> that's not really, I understand what's in his heart, okay? Uh, that's not really what he's asking for. This is, this is what he's asking for. And the Spirit will take what, we, what we're asking for, what we want, and correct it to be in the will of God to be according with exactly what, what God would want for us and have for us. Because we're not always right. I mean, some, you know, sometimes we're outside of the will of God and what we're asking for, what we want, and even just what we want certain things to stop or whatever. It's just, it's not necessarily according to God's will. And we don't even always know that. But the Spirit knows that. So the Spirit helps us out and, and will make intercession. It intercedes for us and say, okay, God, here's... Here's what, what Pastor Burson is really asking for. And then we have this, this extra added promise here in verse number 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So, um, you know, the Bible, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So this isn't that all things work together for good to anyone who's ever been saved before. This is for them that love God. And if you love God, you're going to keep his commandments. So people who are trying to do what's right and, you know, and going along, that road, along uh, the life that God has laid out for you, 
all things will work together for good. It doesn't mean that all things that happen are going to feel good at the time, but it's going to work together for good. So the bad times, the afflictions, the distresses, the necessities, all these things that you work for, if you're doing what's right, it's all going to come together in the end. It's going to result in good. So that's, that's another comforting scripture, another comforting passage that we could turn to when things don't seem to be going well at all and maybe everything looks to be falling apart around you. Turn to Galatians chapter 4. <coughs> We're going to go back to Paul's infirmity. In Galatians chapter 4, he brings this up again. And what we're going to see here is um, one of the reasons why I think it has to do with his eyes. In another epistle, the Apostle Paul says, You see how large a letter I've written with mine own hand. He's making a point that, because oftentimes he'll, he'll have someone just writing down his words as he uh, says them, you know, as he speaks. He dictates and someone else is writing. And then in another one, though, Apostle Paul's saying, because you could see the different person's handwriting in the letters, right, obviously. And the Apostle Paul would sign off on all of the epistles that he was sending, basically just showing that the person who's receiving it, okay, yeah, this is really from the Apostle Paul. This isn't just someone else writing in Paul's name that Paul had no idea they were writing to him. So he signs off. They could see his writing. They know his signature. But... There's one where he's saying, look, I wrote this whole letter to you with my own hand. And, um, you know, he's making a point out of that. I think one of the reasons that he might not have written letters had to do with this ailment that he received. Maybe, maybe not. That could be some speculation. But look at Galatians chapter 4, verse number 13. He's, he's speaking to the church of Galatia now. Uh, the Bible reads, You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you, at the first. So even though he already has this infirmity in the flesh, he says, I I'm, I'm working through that. He's not letting that stop him or prevent him from preaching the gospel. He says, through the infirmity of the flesh, I preached unto you the gospel at the first. So he's continuing to do the work of the Lord. And he's saying the people of Galatia, they knew whatever, whatever his infirmity was, they were able to, to recognize it and see that he wasn't whole. He wasn't right as he, it wasn't like an internal problem that he had. It was something external where they can see because they knew that he was preaching the gospel through the infirmity of the flesh. Verse 14, and my temptation, which is in my flesh, ye despised not. So basically when he came to them, they didn't just reject him because he looks like a freak, because he looks like a weirdo, because, oh, you've got this problem. Stay away from me, buddy. Right? They didn't, they didn't, uh, he didn't despise him. Because oftentimes that's what people will do. Someone looks different. They have some problem. They have some growth on their face. They've got, you know, whatever. And people might just be like, oh, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't want to talk to you because that's just kind of weird. He says, in my temptation, which was in my flesh, he despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. He's saying, you had, you had a great heart. You received me as if I was Jesus Christ himself, that, that they had no problems with the infirmity in his flesh. He refers to that. Verse 15, where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. This is why I think he had an infirmity something to do with his eyes because he's referring to say, hey, you had such a great heart that even if, if it were possible, you would have given me your own eyes to fix my problem. Now, this could be a manner of speech of just saying, well, you'd give someone the shirt off your own back or whatever. I think it has more to do with his physical ailment. But again, speculation, not that big of a deal. You disagree with me, fine, whatever. It doesn't negate any of the, the concepts that we're talking about tonight. But I, I think when you start adding all these things together, it probably did have something to do with his vision, something to do with his eyes, something, some problem. I, I've heard people go as far as to say, well, when he was on the road to Damascus, you know, there's that great light that blinded him and things like that. I don't buy that at all because he refers to a, a, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. 
And that's where he received the infirmity in his flesh. That wasn't the messenger of Satan that met him on the road to Damascus. That was Jesus Christ that, that spoke to him there. That wasn't Satan. So I don't, I don't buy that. I think that's taking things a little bit too far. But, um, but I do think it had to do with his eyes. You're saying, you know, they had this love for him that even though he had this problem, and for him, even though he had this problem, he probably had this thought or this fear that, hey, people might not want to have anything to do with me because I'm deformed, because I don't look right. God's grace is sufficient. Maybe you have some problem that you think, oh, no one would ever want to listen to me. Don't rely on your own strength to serve God. There was a girl at, when I was going to Faith Ward Baptist Church who had Down syndrome. But you know what? Praise God that her and her parents would, you know, she would go out soul winning. That her parents didn't just be like, oh no, she can't do this because she has Down syndrome. You know, she has, she has this disability. Because many people I could see potentially doing that. Right? Holding someone back while well, they're disabled, you know. But she was able to serve God in a capacity that I think nobody else was able to do because she had that disability. She was able to reach people that may have slammed the door on any other able-bodied person, but because you see somebody who has this infirmity in their flesh but still is going trying to do a good work, people will sit there and listen to that person. And she was able to get people saved that potentially might not have listened to anyone else. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is whatever your ailment is, whatever your problem is, whatever it is you think might potentially hold you back from doing something, don't let that get in your mind as, you know, if it's some physical thing or whatever, some infirmity, God will actually work through that if you're willing to work through that. Let God's grace be sufficient for you. Turn, if you would, please, to Lamentations chapter 3. It's the last place we'll look at. Lamentations between the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Lamentations. We're going to look at chapter number three. Now, it's normal to have grief and to have sorrow. You know, I just want to throw this out there too. Because we live in a society where medicine is trying to prescribe pills for just about everything. You know, trying to fix all the world's problems with, with pills or whatever. Oh, oh, you're sad. Oh, you're grieving. Here, take this pill to make you happy. Take this Prozac. Take this, you know, antidepressant or whatever. And instead of just allowing people to deal with, with their problems and deal with it appropriately, not, not running to drugs and calling some chemical imbalance. No, you just need to deal with things. Um, there, and there's nothing wrong or abnormal about that. You know, women who have miscarriages or whatever have, have these problems or parents who suffer the loss of a child, you know, very, very uh, serious events that cause a lot of grief. It's normal to go through grief and whatever, but instead of turning to, you know, the, the drugs or the alcohol or, you know, whether it be doctor prescribed drugs or street drugs, doesn't matter. Instead of turning to something like that to help get you through your grief, we need to turn to the Lord and turn to the Word of God and get strength from His promises and, and get strength even just from your own salvation. Like the Bible says, you know, my grace is sufficient for thee. And remember that whatever it is that you're going through, God can still use you and God hears you and all things work together for good to those that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. 
that while things may not seem to be that great right now, in, in, in one moment, in the end, have the patience and have the faith to be able to, to push through and persevere and maintain your integrity in the Lord so that you, could, you can trust Him. It will be all right in the end. It will be good in the end. Lamentations chapter 3, we're going to read through this and then we'll be done. But there's just, there's a lot um, in this chapter that, that goes right along with the same concept I've been preaching. Of course, Lamentations is, is this book, you know, um, Jeremiah, when the children of Israel were taken captive and just kind of lamenting, right? Lamenting over all the, all the, the things that have happened. It's a sad time. Children of Israel going captive because of all their sins and everything else and they're losing everything and everything's destroyed. That's not the best time to go through. And especially for someone like Jeremiah, who's going along with it. He's a man of God. And there's some other men of God, but you know, the children of Israel, by and large, they, they needed to be judged. Ju you know, Israel got judged and then Judah needed to be judged too. And they're going along with this. They're doing what's right. And you know what? In the end, it pays off. For the prophets it pays off for the man of God but it's still not easy when you're going through it and when we get a little bit of insight into this look at Lamentations chapter 3 look at verse number 1 Bible reads I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath he hath led me and brought me into darkness but not into light surely against me is he turned he turneth his hand against me all the day my flesh and my skin hath he made old he hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Also when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. And as we read this, we're going to keep reading through quite a bit of this chapter. Just, just, you know, imagine this place that he's, he's talking about, just individually that he's in. It's a, it's a desperate situation, right? But there's, there's hope. But, but what he's talking about here, it sounds like there is no hope. When I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. It sounds like God's not even listening to me, right? He hedges me in. Normally when you see about being hedged in, it's a good thing because you're, 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 you have defensive walls up, but he's saying he's hedging me and I can't get out. Like I'm stuck here and it's not a good place to be. I want to get out of here, but I'm stuck in here. Dark places. You know, I cry, shout, he shouts out my prayer. Verse number nine, he hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, my strength in my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. Verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. So even through all these hard times and troubles and just not a great situation, He's saying the Lord's mercy is allowing us not to just be completely just consumed and wiped off, right? They're, they're receiving chastening and disciplining and everything else, and it's not fun. It's not pleasant at all. He's going through some hard times. He says, but thank God for his mercy that we're just not completely consumed. His compassions fail not. Verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. Notice how there's a turn in the chapter. 
how, how dark and, and dreary and, and grievous everything seemed to be at the beginning. But now when we look at, hey, the Lord's mercies, they don't fail. His compassions fail not. Verse 26, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust, if so be there may be hope. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is filled full with reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. He's saying that God's not going to cast off forever. You know, there's still hope. God, yes, there's times where there's chastisement and punishment and hard times come through, but God's just not done with you. Right? And again, and again, this has to do in the context, we're talking about you know, children of God that have strayed from the Lord, right? Not, not exactly the same context that we started with of doing what's right and receiving, you know, persecutions and tribulations. But you can see how when you're still going through a dark time, we can still look to the Lord either way for that hope and know that God is a God of grace and mercy and, and know that even, even when you're doing wrong or have done wrong, that, you know, the Lord's not going to cast off forever and he does have mercy and compassion. Look at verse number 34. To crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth, to turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High, to subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. Who is he that saith and it cometh to pass when the Lord commandeth it not? Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good? Wherefore doth a living man complain? A man for the punishment of his sins. He's saying, why does why would a man complain for especially for the punishment of his own sins? Like when you do wrong, there should be no complaining there. Look at verse number 40. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heaven. We have transgressed and have rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned, thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us, thou hast slain, thou hast not pitied, thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayers should not pass through, thou hast made us as the offscouring and refuse in the midst of the people. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us, fear and a snare has come upon us, desolation and destruction. Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people." Mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth not without any intermission, till the Lord look down and behold from heaven. Mine eye affecteth mine heart because of all the daughters of my city. Mine enemies chased me sore like a bird without cause. They have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast a stone upon me. Waters flowed over mine head. Then I said, I am cut off. Verse 55, I called upon thy name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. Thou hast heard my voice. Hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou saidst, fear not. There is always hope there in the Lord for his people. Always. And even in the darkest time, lowest point, darkest dungeon, he says, I called unto the Lord and Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Last place I'm going to cover tonight is in Hebrews chapter 13. Going back to the theme verse, my grace is sufficient for thee. And again, what's this meant to do? This is meant to edify you and to, and to help have a right mindset when we go through hard times. Lamentations, you know, if you're, if you're reaping what you've sown, if you're receiving of, of wrong that's been done, there's still hope, right? Don't give up. Sometimes you need to be chastened and dealt with because of your own sins and what you've done. But it, there's still hope in God. Don't turn away from God and add sin unto sin, right? And, and just forsake the Lord because you're going through hard times. It's just like, you know, when, a, when you discipline a child, 
you know, what you want to see is that is that repentance when they when they receive the chastening. No one likes it, but what, what the whole goal is to get them to just say, okay, I'm sorry, I want to do what's right now and, and, and love their parents as opposed to making things even worse by becoming bitter and, and no, I'm not going to, you know, and continuing down that bad path, that rotten path or having a rotten attitude. Even if they don't do the same exact thing they did, not having that right heart uh, uh, is only going to cause more problems down the road. So, um, but in Hebrews chapter 13, ultimately what it boils down to, no matter what your situation, we need to learn to be content. Being content with what we have. Being content whether we have ailments or not. Learning to live with things and deal with them appropriately. It doesn't mean it's a sin to be sad or grieve or whatever. It's just you know, to help us to get through the hard times, learning contentment. Because if you're not content, you're going to end up being bitter. You're going to end up covetous, wanting things that maybe you can't have. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So one of the reasons why we could be content and not be covetous, we've got a promise from God, from Jesus. Hey, Jesus is never going to leave you or forsake you. What more do you need? He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Jesus is never going to leave you or forsake you. Ever. It's kind of hard when you think about things in that way, when you look at the big picture, to start becoming overly distraught over your temporal situation. You've got Jesus. God's looking out for you. His grace is sufficient for thee. So, you know, there, there's so many aspects of God that are just absolutely wonderful. All of them. They're great. God loves you. He cares about you. You know, things are going to be hard at different points in your life. If you keep serving God, you're going to be faced with trials and, and, and troubles. But just try to keep the big picture in mind that God's grace is sufficient for you and, and that God can actually use you even more when you have those hard times, when they come upon you. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your love and mercy and long-suffering and your grace. Lord, help us to um, be cognizant of the grace that you've already bestowed upon us, especially when we go through the hard times, that we can rest in your grace and actually not just... Um, not be as, as upset, but actually joy. Like the Apostle Paul, he said, I'm going to rejoice in mine infirmities. And, and if we're having troubles and trials and persecution, persecutions as a result of doing good, Lord, help us have that same attitude the Apostle Paul had of actually learning to rejoice in those situations because we can see the big picture, because we have the faith in knowing that... Um, that we're on the right path and that, and that whatever that we go through in this life that you will reward us for in the next life, dear Lord. And we love you and we thank you for your promises and your faithfulness. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.